The Tychus, Our Geoaxial Binary System, by Simon Schack, read from the first edition of August 1, 2018. Preface The Tychus is my proposed cosmic model. It is based on, inspired by, and built around both modern and time-honored astronomical observations. In particular, my work has relied and expanded upon a number of lesser-known, overlooked, and or neglected teachings from the 1500s to the 1800s, as well as from antiquity. To cite and acknowledge them all would be unrealistic, so I dedicate this study to a few brilliant astronomers whose work has been passed over in favor of the so-called Copernican Revolution. These early insightful architects who laid the groundwork for what should be our current model for the solar system include Nilakanta Somayayi, author of the Tantra Sangra of 1501, Samantha Chandra Sekara Sima, also known as Patani Samantha, 1835-1904, the ancient Maya, Aztec, Sumerian, Greek, Egyptian, and others, astronomers, and of course, Tycho Boe, along with his trusty helper, Longo Montanus, whose impeccable observational data and tables still stand today as the most exacting ever made. In spite of Brahe's rigorous and unchallenged documentation, his own model of the solar system was ultimately flipped on its head by his assistant, the famous Johannes Kepler. Kepler used his master's observations in his laborious attempts to validate his diametrically opposed Copernican model. As only a few people will know, Kepler was ultimately, in 1988, exposed for having falsified Brahe's all-important observational data pertaining to Mars, so as to make them agree with his heliocentric thesis. His legacy is therefore eminently questionable. Brahe had specifically entrusted him with resolving the bewildering behavior of this particular celestial body, and Kepler's laws of planetary motion were almost exclusively mathematically derived from his relentless war on Mars, as he liked to call it. Just why the Mars data presented such exceptional difficulties should become self-evident in the following pages. I trust that any earnest astronomer will concede that the currently accepted Copernican model is by no means flawless. It is afflicted by a number of still unresolved anomalies and incongruities. The persistence of several long-standing enigmas are readily admitted throughout the more honest and candid sort of astronomy literature. It is thus a widely diffused popular misconception that the Copernican model has provided mankind with a most indisputable interpretation of the formidable wealth of astronomical observations gathered throughout human history. As we shall see, it is not only disputable, it is outright impossible. In short, the Tychus provides the missing pieces which prevented Tycho Brahe from completing the puzzle of his geo-heliocentric system, in spite of the basic soundness of its geometric design. The Tychus model, while stopping far short of proposing a TOE, theory of everything, submits nonetheless what may be the most exacting, logical and intuitively sound geometric configuration of our local cosmos ever devised. As I discovered following the reason of the data itself results a series of cosmological paradoxes that falsify the currently adopted Copernican theory of our universe. It is an unfortunate characteristic of their present proponents to be recalcitrant towards and dismissive of data that they have failed to incorporate into a holistic self-consistency. To ease explanations, I have done my best to employ simple graphics. 
I have also strived to use the simplest possible maths at all times, so as to make this text accessible to the widest possible readership range, including myself. I have always found complex equations both tedious and laborious. Fortunately, the core principles of the Tychus model can be expressed and outlined with a bare minimum of computations, all in the good tradition of Tycho Brahe's very own philosophy. Quote, so mathematical truth prefers simple words since the language of truth is itself simple. Unquote. The Tychus is built upon the unchallenged raw data collection of thousands of years of human study of the stars and planets. Hence, my model may simply be considered the natural evolution of Tycho's work enabled at last by a number of modern astronomical discoveries. It is the result of a fresh reinterpretation of ancient and modern astronomical knowledge, as well as a few lucky hunches of my own. I will humbly ask this world's scientific community and all free-thinking people of integrity and to carefully assess its principles with an open mind, devoid of prejudice and preconceptions. I am aware that you will naturally ask yourself the following question. Why has no one seen or thought of all this before? And who is this impertinent fellow, without any academic credential to his name, having the gall to question the current universally accepted cosmic model? All I can say is, please read on. Let your own mind decide whether Copernican or the Tychus model works best for you, that is to say, for your inborn faculties of intuition and logical thought. As I dived into this cosmic research odyssey some five years ago, driven by sheer curiosity and an earnest passion for intellectual inquiry, I had no way to expect, even in my wildest imagination, that I would reach any solid conclusions worthy of your time. Yet it now appears to my pleasant surprise that I was wrong about that. My best guess is that some lucky star has helped me along in what has certainly been the most enthralling discovery journey of my lifetime. Rudolf Steiner once wrote, quote, Now today we have a very remarkable fact, my dear friends. This Copernican system, when employed purely mathematically, supplies the necessary calculations concerning the observed phenomena as well as, and no better, than any of the earlier ones. The eclipses of the sun and moon can be calculated with the ancient Chaldean system, with the Egyptian, with the Taconian, and with the Copernican. The outer occurrences in the heavens, in so far as they relate to mechanics or mathematics, can thus be foretold. One system is as well suited as another. It is only that the simplest thought pictures arise with the Copernican system. But the strange thing is that in practical astronomy, calculations are not made with the Copernican system. Curiously enough, in practical astronomy, to obtain what is needed for the calendar, the system of Tycho Brahe is used. This shows how little that is really fundamental, how little of the essential nature of things comes into question when the universe is thus pictured in purely mathematical curves or in terms of mechanical forces. Unquote. From Third Scientific Lecture Course on Astronomy Schmidt number S4337, lecture 2, in Stuttgart, of January the 2nd, 1921, by Rudolf Steiner. Evidently, Steiner's acumen, clairvoyance, and intellectual honesty were admirable in this subject. This is more than can be said about many of our modern-day men and women of science, in particular those in the fields of astronomy and cosmology, who oft refuse to consider new ideas which may challenge their long-established beliefs. The process of discovery requires, of course, the very opposite intellectual attitude. I apologize to those entrenched in their replication of principles they have only inherited from other minds, 
for an embarrassment or even distress that Tychus might cause. However, I earnestly propose that it is now high time to think differently. Many important new discoveries have, in later decades, severely imperiled the very foundational precepts of the heliocentric theory of our cosmos, as submitted by Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Newton, Einstein, and others. The failure to act upon these new discoveries casts a shadow of the credibility of our world's scientific community as a whole. Forward some basic intellectual problems with the Copernican model. It can hardly be denied that the Copernican model is marred by a number of problems which, objectively speaking, challenge the limits of our human senses and perceptions. To my mind, there is nothing intuitive about the Copernican theory. Even if you disagree, I think it is safe to say that the current widespread acceptance of it relies on the faith that most people have conferred to those prominent scientists who, about four centuries ago, decided for every one of us that it was not only a credible theory of our universe, but that it was indeed the definitive one. Paradoxically, the so-called Copernican Revolution was hailed as the triumph of scientific method over religious dogma. Yet when challenged by the likes of Tycho Brahe about the absurd distances and titanic sizes of the stars that the novel Copernican model's tenets implied, the proponents of the same invoked the omnipotence of God. Quote, Tycho Brahe, the most prominent and accomplished astronomer of his era, made measurements of the apparent sizes of the sun, moon, stars and planets. From these he showed that within a geocentric cosmos these bodies were of comparable sizes, with the sun being the largest body and the moon the smallest. He further showed that within a heliocentric cosmos the stars had to be absurdly large, with the smallest star dwarfing even the sun. Various Copernicans responded to this issue of observation and geometry by appealing to the power of God. They argued that giant stars were not absurd because even such giant objects were nothing compared to an infinite God, and that in fact the Copernican stars pointed out the power of God to humankind. Tycho rejected this argument. Unquote, from Christopher M. Graney, December 2011, regarding how Tycho Brahe noted the absurdity of the Copernican theory regarding the bigness of stars while the Copernicans appealed to God to answer that absurdity. It is commonly thought and taught that the Copernican revolution marked the end of religious bigotry. Well, nothing is further from the truth. If you had been questioning the Copernic model back then, you might have been called a person of a vulgar sort, since, according to Copernicans, you were therefore questioning God's divine omnipotence. Quote, Rather than give up their theory in the face of seemingly incontrovertible physical evidence, Copernicans were forced to appeal to divine omnipotence. These things that vulgar sorts see as absurd at first glance are not easily charged with absurdity, for in fact divine sapience and majesty are far greater than they understand, wrote Copernican Christoph Rothmann in a letter to Tycho Brahe. Grant the vastness of the universe and the sizes of the stars to be as great as you like, these will still bear no proportion to the infinite creator. It reckons that the greater the king, so much greater and larger the palace befitting his majesty. So how great a palace do you reckon is fitting to God? Unquote. Taken from The Case Against Copernicus by Dennis Danielson and Christopher M. Graney in March 2014 for Scientific American, March 2014, 3.10.1, 72-7. Indeed, it is a widespread popular myth that Johannes Kepler was the man who brought on the era of rational scientific determinism to the detriment of dogmatic religious belief. Again, nothing is further from the truth. 
as J. R. Fölkel points out in his The Composition of Kepler's Astronomia Nova from 2001, quote, he, Kepler, sought to, re sought to redirect his religious aspirations into astronomy by arguing that the heliocentric system of the world made plain the glory of God in his creation of the world. Thus he made the establishment of the physical truth of heliocentrism a religious vocation, unquote. Now, it is a matter of fact that today our world's premier scientific institutions cannot even seem to agree upon the distance from Earth to Polaris, our all-important current North Star. Quote, the North Star has been a guiding light for countless generations of navigators, but a new study reveals that its distance to Earth may have been grossly overestimated. The new discovery of a closer North Star is most unexpected for what is considered to be one of the Hipparchus satellite's most solid results, said study leader David Turner, an astronomer at St. Mary's University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Unquote. From North Star Closer to Earth Than Thought by Andrew Faskias, December 5th, 2012, for National Geographic News. As mentioned in the above-linked National Geographic article, this is no trivial matter since Polaris is a cosmological yardstick used by researchers to measure great cosmic distances out of billions of light years. Well, the latest 2012 estimation of the Earth to Polaris distance, 323 light years, is a whooping 34% shorter than the form estimate of 433 light years, as listed in official ESA and NASA star catalogues. In light of this, it would hardly be unreasonable to question the much vaunted pinpoint accuracy of modern astronomy. If Polaris is now believed to be as much as one third closer to us than previously thought, the very credibility of all currently claimed star distances must be allowed to be questioned. Indeed, it would be a logical scientific enterprise to recheck all one's work once it is discovered that one's yardstick is capable of expanding and contracting when we aren't paying attention. To it, how can our current North Star Polaris, which is actually a triple star binary system, possibly seem to remain stationary above our North Pole year after year and for decades on end. And this when we are meant to be sweeping around a 300 million kilometer wide orbit covering an orbit with a circumference of almost 1 billion kilometers. Today we are told that the Sun and thus our entire system hurtles across our galaxy at the formidable speed of 800,000 kilometers an hour, or 222 kilometers per second, and around a gigantic 240 million year long orbit. Yet Polaris appears to remain roughly in the same place year after year. In the course of one year, as Earth supposedly revolved around the Sun, around a 300 million kilometer wide orbit, our current North Star Polaris appears to be virtually stationary. You may now justly ask, is Polaris also said to be moving along with Earth at 200,000 kilometers an hour? No, it is not we are simply asked to accept the following surreal notion. Earth orbits around the Sun at about 107,000 kilometers, while the Sun itself moves at 800,000 kilometers an hour. Yet we do not see our current North Star Polaris moving much at all, because it is unimaginably distant. Surely the time has come to question such extraordinary claims which objectively challenge the limits of human intuition. When something is unimaginable, 
there should be plenty of room for discourse, no matter how established any scientific theory may be. I will venture to say that the Tycho's model may ideally satisfy both sides of the secular heliocentric versus geocentric debate, since it proposes an ideal unifying solution that may appeal to both parties if they can first choose that agreeing on something would cause no harm. In the Tycho's, our Earth is neither static or immobile, nor does it hurtle across space at hypersonic speeds nor is our planet located by the will of God, smack in the middle of the entire universe. Instead, it is just located at or near the barycenter of our very own binary system. Among other things, the Tycho's model revives Plato's ideal concept of uniform circular motion. As we shall see, Kepler's elliptical and accelerating decelerating orbital motions may well be a spatial illusion largely caused by Earth slowly moving around the center of our system. Quote, Kepler's laws are wonderful as a description of the motions of the planets. However, they provide no explanation of why the planets move in this way. Unquote. From Kepler's laws and Newton's laws, from a Mount Holyoke College course in Massachusetts. For now, and before we get on, let us remind ourselves of the Copernican model's so-called elegant geometric configuration, starring the Sun, which would be positioned in the middle of a multi-lane planetary merry-go-round, that is, a carousel of planets revolving around the Sun in concentric elliptical orbits. The heliocentric Copernican model undeniably appeals to our natural senses, what with its plain and orderly layout. There is a clear middle, and what's more, there's an object right there in it, the brightest and most obvious object in our skies. The problem is that its geometric layout conflicts with empirical observations, and therefore it cannot possibly represent reality as will be amply demonstrated in the following chapters, it is outright unphysical, as it violates, among other things, the most elementary laws of perspective. It bears reminding that, since their initial acceptance by our world's scientific community, the fundamental premises of the Copernican model have had to undergo a long series of profound critiques and revisions, all of which were somehow patched up with ad hoc arguments submitted by a clique of extremely influential fellows, for example Newton, Galileo, Kepler, Einstein, Bradley, etc. It is disconcerting that so much faith has been placed in those few individuals' convictions. It is also most disturbing that, over the years, numerous findings by independent researchers in validating the Copernican theory have been completely ignored by the worldwide scientific community. If astronomy considers itself a science, it ought to be taking a good hard look in the mirror today. As you may remember, if you are old enough, the old Copernican theory went like this. The sun is immobile, just like the stars, while all of our planets orbit around it in concentric circles whereas the current Copernican theory sounds a lot like this. The Sun travels at 800,000 kilometers across our galaxy, along with all of its companions, completing one orbit every 240 million years. Both theories always were and still remain eminently questionable for a number of reasons. The old Copernican theory contradicts the empirically observable fact that not one of our visible stars are entirely immobile or motionless. The old notion implied that our Sun would be the only immobile star of our entire visible cosmos, an absurd proposition that I trust can safely be put to rest. The current Copernican theory, which claims that our Sun needs circa 240 million years to complete only an orbit, 
conflicts with the observable fact that the overwhelming majority of our visible stars appear to have much smaller local orbits of their own with relatively short periods. For instance, the orbital period of the Sirius A and B binary system is only 50.1 solar years. The binary system of Alpha Centauri A and B revolve around each other in only 79.9 years, while the Polaris A and B binary pair do so in just 29.6 years. Other recently discovered binary systems exhibit even shorter mutual orbital periods of only a couple of years, months, weeks, days or less. No stars, other than our own Sun, are said to be observed to be moving around orbits in the range of hundreds of million years. And yes, it is indeed officially claimed that the Sun employs 240 or 250 million years to complete just one of its orbits. I am certainly not making this up. See, how long does it take the Sun to orbit the galaxy? by Robert Matthews of July the 22nd, 2009 at sciencefocus.com. Moreover, our visible stars exhibit far slower apparent orbital velocities than 222 km per second, that is 800,000 km an hour, the alarming orbital speed at which our system is claimed to move across our galaxy. For instance, our nearmost binary stars Alpha Centauri and A and Alpha Centauri B exhibit orbital speeds, also known as proper motions, of 21.4 km per second and 18.6 km per second. As it happens, such speeds compare well with the orbital speeds, as of the Tycho's model, of our Sun 29.7 km per second and Mars 22.7 km per second. To be sure, a star has never been observed to move ten times that fast. Even the fastest moving star in our skies, the Barnard stars, is reckoned to be travelling at about 110 km per second, more than 50% slower than our Sun's supposed motion around the galaxy. Indeed, these foundational notions upheld by current theory truly stand out for their extraordinary claims. Give it a good thought. According to modern astronomy, our Sun would be the one and only star in our observed cosmos to have a meager, gigantic, unthinkably large 240 million year orbit, with an incredibly small angular momentum, unlike any other star around our galaxy. Our Sun would be the fastest star of them all, traveling at a scorching 222 km per second and all the while carrying Earth and our system's other planets along with it. And yet, we earthly observers can only detect minuscule stellar parallaxes from one year or decade to the next. In the latest decades of astronomical research, a particular discovery stands out for its paradigm-changing nature. The vast majority of our visible stars have turned out to be interlocked in what is known as binary systems. In binary systems, a large star and a far smaller celestial body, often too small and dim to be detected even with the largest telescopes, revolve in relatively short, mutually intersecting local orbits around a common center of mass or barycenter. Again, no binary systems are observed to have orbital periods lasting anywhere near 250 million years. I feel it is more reasonable to consider the possibility that our system is alike to other systems, rather than some sort of exception to the rule.